شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الظاهر بالكرم مجده الباسط بالجود يده الذي لا تنغص خزائنه ولا تزيده كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوهام اللهم إني أسألك قليلا من كثير مع حاجة بي إليه عظيما وغناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وصفحك عن ظلمي وسترك عن قبيح عملي وحلمك عن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطئي وعمدي أطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من غدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدعوك آمنا وأسألك مستأنسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قسدت فيه إليك فإن أبطأ عني اعتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبطأ عني هو خير لي لعلمك بعاقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أصبر على عبد لئيما منك علي يا رب إنك تدعوني فأولي عنك وتتحبب إلي فأتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فارحم عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإصباح ديان الدين رب العالمين 
الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الإصباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منازع يعادله ولا شبيه يشاكله ولا ظهير يعاضده قهر بعزته الأعزاء وتواضع لعظمته العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويسر علي كل عورة وأنا أعصي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من موهبة هنيئة قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبهجة مونغة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك حجابه ولا يغلق بابه ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب آمله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وعمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسبح 
في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأزكى وأنمى وأطيب وأطهر وأسنى وأكثر ما صليت وباركت وتحرمت وتحننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفوتك وأهل الكرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبطي الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة وصل على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهاد المهدي حججك على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائما اللهم وصل على ولي أمرك القائم المؤمل والعدل المنتظر وحفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالمين 
اللهم اجعله الداعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبل مكن له دينا الذي ارتضيته لا أبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا اللهم أذهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فحملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا واشعب به صدعنا وارتق به فتقنا وكثر به قلتنا وأعزز به ذلتنا وأغن به عائلنا واغض به عن مغرمنا واجبر به فغرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسر به عسرنا وبيض به وجوهنا وفك به أسرنا وأنجح به طلبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا وأعطنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا وأعطنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المعطين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به غيظ قلوبنا واهدنا به لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إله الحق آمين 
اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتظاهر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وأعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجله وبذر تكشفه ونصر تعزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجللناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوم كدرت وإذا الجبال سيرت وإذا العشار عطلت وإذا الوحوش حشرت وإذا البحار سجرت وإذا النفوس زوجت وإذا المؤودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت وإذا الصحف نشرت وإذا السماء كشطت وإذا الجحيم سعرت وإذا الجنة أزلفت علمت نفس ما أحضرت فلا أقسم بالخنس الجوان الكنس والليل إذا عسعس والصبح إذا تنفس إنه لقول رسول كريم ذي قوة عند ذي العرش 
العرش مكين مطاع ثم أمين وما صاحبكم بمجنون ولقد رآه بالأفق المبين وما هو على الغيب بغني وما هو بقول شيطان رجيم فأين تذهبون إن هو إلا ذكر لمن شاء منكم أن يستقيم وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية فادقني في عبادي وادخني جنتي صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأطهار جميعا على رسول الله وآله الأطهار صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you all to the Islamic House of Wisdom where tonight we are here together celebrating another night of Shahr Ramadan. As you know, our program starts at 9.30 p.m. sharp with Dua Iftitah. We then uh, go to the Quran recitation and then to our English program with Hajj Hassanin Rajab Ali. Uh, the Arabic program runs simultaneously inside the masjid uh, and that also starts uh, after Dua Iftitah and Quran recitation. I do have a couple announcements. Uh, every single day we have Jama'a Fajr and Maghrib and Isha prayers. So the masjid opens 10 minutes before Salat al-Fajr uh, and it opens 30 minutes to an hour before Salat al-Maghrib where they recite, uh, they start the khatm of the Qur'an. So we have khatm of the Qur'an 30 minutes before Salat al-Maghrib and then it, uh, it continues after the Arabic majlis. Brothers and sisters, if you have been following our socials at Youth of Wisdom, you know that tonight we also have a Q&A session with Suhoor with Hajj Hassani, uh, inshallah, inside the masjid. That will be after the English program. So the Suhoor with a specific, uh, more informal Q&A will be inside the masjid. Right around 11.15 we'll, uh, is the time where we will be starting. Hajj Hassani will be shorten, shortening his lecture tonight as well. Uh, if anyone has questions here, He'll be taking some questions uh, in order to have uh, a back and forth dialogue. 
Follow us on at Youth of Wisdom, at IHW Connect. The lectures are being live streamed on both YouTube and Facebook. So if you ever want to go back, YouTube, IHW Connect, or uh, on Facebook, that's where you can see all of the lectures. We have our Imam Hassan السلام, celebration, birth celebration on March 24th, a Sunday, Majina celebration. That is an, a fantastic event uh, for the younger ones. There will be lots of goodie bags, lots of candies. Uh, and we'll be celebrating the tradition of Gargi'an or Majina, uh, as they say. We do have sponsors for tonight's Suhoor uh, with Hajj Hassani. Uh, if we can please send a Fatiha for Hajj Khudr Kubaisi and the Sibilini family after a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker tonight, Hajj Hassanin Rajab Ali, to the podium after three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى إنه للقرآن سيد لو, أنزل لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيت وخاشعا متصدعا من خشة الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah, beginning in Allah's name. And Allah is Almighty, the Great. We would not exist if Allah didn't create us. We would not continue to exist if Allah didn't sustain us. And our return would have no meaning, meaning the future would be totally meaningless if Allah were not there to receive us and to fulfill the promise that He has given us. Allah says, Inna wa'dullah al haqq meaning that inna ladhina amanu amilu salihat lahum jannatun na'im khalidina fiha wa'dallahi haqq meaning those who believe and do good Allah promises them a safe place in paradise and this is a promise that Allah says it's the truth very very important many of us don't really believe in that while well, we know it but we really don't believe in it or we don't pay much tribute to it, therefore it's shallow in our hearts, which then leads us to make wrong choices when we're tested. It's a very fundamental issue. This night I've been talking about is the, just as a summary, has been about taqwa. As I said, taqwa is about protection, it's about God consciousness. For tawheed is the central principle in Islam. The importance of the Holy Prophet, the importance of Ahlul Bayt, the importance of, you know, Wilaya, all of that importance, including Ma'ad, which is the Day of Judgment, is only because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you and I do not have a grasp or a general connection with God, we are not going to make good decisions when Allah tests us. I promise you. It's just human nature. We're Muslims, we declare we're Muslims, 
But when trials and tribulations come our way, we run in the opposite direction. Allah mentions that many times in the Quran, that when the enemy would attack, some of the people who claim to be believers would run away. Right? And Allah condemns that and says, what's wrong with you? Do you not have faith? So this conversation I'm having in these nights of Ramadan is to instill upon all of us the importance of getting a grasp about Tawheed. And I'll tell you, when is the best time to get close to Tawheed? It's when you and I have problems. The more difficult the problem, the closer we will get to Allah if we understand what I'm talking about. When you and I turn to Allah, Allah says, وَإِذَا غَشْيَوْ مَوْجٌ كَالْذُلَلِي دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ when the waves are covering them in the ocean and they're about to drown, it's a very daunting ta feeling, you know, precarious, like on a plane. You know, just a few days ago, we heard that this plane dropped, you know, and people were literally hit the roof of the plane and had to go to the hospital, and some of them were terribly injured. So you have no idea. You're sitting in this plane, enjoying, watching a movie, and the next thing, the plane drops. And if you don't have that seatbelt on, or the, the window pops open, like that happened in the other airline, right? And people got sucked out, and you can actually go, of course, Hamza, nobody got sucked out, but you could go flying out in the air and get thrown and instantly die. And Allah says, that can happen. What are you going to do? Allah says, وَإِذَا غَشْيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالْظُلَلِي دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ When they're in that state of about to lose their lives, they turn to God sincerely. I've mentioned this before even, but I had a teenager at the Islamic Center of America many years ago when I was lecturing. He came and says, can you please teach me how to pray? I said, how old are you? He says, I'm 17 years old. I said, that's interesting. I've never had a 17 year old typically come and say, can you please teach me how to pray? 17 year olds kind of look at you and says, you're a religious person talking about God. It's not my, you know, my love for that. My love is to go out and have fun and chase girls and you know, do whatever. That's for the boys, of course. Uh, and, and you talk to them about God, they look at you like, yeah, well, whatever. I'll think about it before I die. When I get old, I'll go to those lectures, right? 16, 17-year-old coming to me, can you come and teach me prayers? I said, of course I'll teach you, but what's the rush? He said, I want you to teach me now. I said, now? He said, yes. I said, okay, I'll show you how to pray. But then I asked him, I said, what's the reason? He said, yesterday my best friend died and I watched him die. He and I were doing stunts in a car on Ford Road somewhere, I don't know. And what, my friend died in front of me. He died. And I watched him leave this world. And it dawned on me that I can also die. But when I are forgetting this reality that, you know, myself having grown up, often when I became ill, I thanked Allah for the first time because all my life, you know, I was an athlete, you know, health-wise was good, and Allah was just giving me the barakat. And Allah says, go, you go to the gym, you can bench press, you know, over 220, 260, you're doing it, mashallah, good for you. If I take one little piece of that tendon of your bicep or something that I make where your joints don't work right, you won't be able to lift. And you're done. So Allah says, I will put you in the fear how are you going to handle it? So what happens is that there's a blessing when we're in danger. You and I want to avoid danger, of course. We don't want to go towards danger. It's foolish to go towards danger. It's foolish to hurt ourselves. I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is the nature of life. The other day I was driving and there was a lunatic driving, you know, and he was, you know, tailgating me, pushing on the side, like he was on drugs, he was on something. You don't know what it is. And you never know, they can come and smack you from the back, shoot you, pull a gun out while they come next to you. Anything can happen. How many people on the highways get killed because of road rage? For no reason, just because they pass you, or maybe you didn't, you know, you flash the lights on them. Just one little point that triggers them and then they, they're exploding and ready to take their anger out. We're living in a very, very slippery, precarious world. And if you look at a person the wrong way, they could be suspicious, especially if they have some kind of a mental problem. You're in danger. You're living in a society where moods are of all types, from the finest of the moods to the worst of the moods. And there are people who are so angry with so much anger, they need to take it out on somebody. And all you have to do is cross their path. 
And then what are you going to do? So the logic of life is that if a believer leaves their home reciting seven times Surah Al-Ikhlas, holds on to the rope of Allah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated, Salawat Allah Muhammad Wa If you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas seven times, Qulullah Ahad Allah Samad, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, seven times the Prophet said, Allah guarantees you will come back the way you left. Very important. I say to our students at Wise, and I say to them, whenever you leave your house, always read Surah Al-Ikhlas. When we go on trips, when we go on ski trips, summer camps, I say to all the kids, recite this Ikhlas, and we're going to keep reading it. And while we're on the road, we're going to read Ikhlas, because there's no greater protection than to call Allah's name. For Allah then changes my destiny. Allah changes it. You know, we have a principle in Islam. We, the Ja'fari school of thought, believe in something called Bada, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes in my destiny depending on how I behave, and Allah changes my course. I could have been destined to die today, but because I was busy delivering a message or teaching somebody, Allah says to the angel, delay it. Now you might say, didn't Allah already know that? Yes, 100% Allah knew that. But Allah will reveal to me why he intervened because of the choices I made. So Allah says, وَإِذَا غَشْهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالْظُلَلِ دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ When they're about to drown, they turn to me sincerely. مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ Oh God, please, I'll do anything, please. Before there was no God, there was arrogance, there was rejection, there was kufr, there was doubt, there was violation. But now your life is on the line. And you're not worried about anything but your life. What about all the money you have? Well, it'll go away. But my life, without my life, what do I have? Even legally, if you sign, you know, um, what we call a full um, power of attorney, it's only valid as long as you're alive. The minute you die, your full power of attorney is nullified instantaneously because you're no longer alive. It has no efficacy in law. Just think about that. So the living aspect of a human being has many, many fundamental gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to touch on that, that sincerely. So when that 16-year-old came to me, I realized, subhanAllah, how merciful Allah is. That while it was a tragedy that he lost his friend, but it took that to bring him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brother still is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there were so many issues in there. In, in, the problems that we constantly pile upon ourselves, sometimes due to our own foolishness, and of course, others. We live in a world where it's very caustic. There are people in this world who are troublemakers. Not the majority, a minority, but all you need is one. One bad apple to create trouble for everybody. And then they create chaos. And that chaos causes problems for people, losses, you know, usurpation, occupation that's happening today in Gaza, for example, and in Palestine. Occupation, which causes people's lives to go through hell because of some foolish, greedy person who wants to occupy somebody else's land, and now they're causing hell for those families to the extent of bulldozing their homes, you know, starving them, bombing them, beheading them, and then they claim that they were victims of the Holocaust. How hypocritical is that? Now, there are Jews who I know personally who understand the dynamics of suffering and they are firm against this and they condemn this kind of occupation. And may Allah bless them. Those to me are the ones who resonate with God. So tonight, I want to touch on that very important aspect. I'm going to jump very quickly uh, because, you know, taqwa, which is protection and God consciousness, requires a very firm understanding of the usul. I cannot stress enough about the importance of the roots of religion. Once you have it, and there's no, by the way, there's no taqlid in usul. You don't do taqlid of a marja in usul. You take guidance from a marja, but you do your own guidance in usul. Furu, taqlid is wajib, but in usul, no. Because usul drives everything. My belief in God, my understanding, 
is what leads me in the direction to make the right decisions. Okay? Very, very important. So Allah says, Law anzalna had al Quran. By the way, that verse, before I go to this one, Allah says, Falamma najjahum ilal barrifa minhum muqtasid. So these people who are going to now drown in the ocean, they turn to God sincerely. This, by the way, God forbid you and I like that. God forbid. Even Yusuf Islam, who was Cat Stevens, he was drowning in the English Channel. And as he's about to drown, he speaks about that in his biography. He said, I turned to God. I said, if you're out there, I will find you. Cat Stevens, famous singer, you know, very successful singer. And as soon as he did that, Allah brought him back to shore. He said, I started looking for God. And subhanAllah, my brother had gone to Palestine and he got a copy of the Quran, which was sitting in my library. Look at the hidayah of Allah, how he guides in mysterious ways, where he just opens up that Quran and he realizes this is the answer I need to be in. And he became a Muslim and he's a world famous Muslim today. He speaks about Islam very, very uh, openly. And that's a blessing. Now, that's a person who was drowning, who turned to Allah sincerely, who became a follower of Allah and is living the life of Allah. That's Cat Stephen. But here Allah says, The ones who turn to God sincerely, but when I bring them back to shore, they take the middle ground. I'm not sure, is God really there? I think that was just fluke. You know, that was just accidental. You know, the equipment just worked. Or, you know, the wave just saved me. So in other words, they completely reject the hand of Allah, okay? Uh, and that's a problem, because when you and I move away from that understanding, then we become kuffar. And think about it, a person who rejects Allah, what else do they have? Honestly, when I see people who reject Allah, atheists, agnostics, I see them, they're good people, but they're confused. And I feel sorry for them. Often when I look at them, I say, this person has no future. What future do you have? But when a person is connected with the eternal and understands the dynamics of how the universe works, not only in the mechanical sense, but at the moral sense, at the spiritual sense, at the eternal sense, we're talking about very high level conversations. So Allah says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَ If we were to reveal this Qur'an on a mountain, it would tremble and crumble. This Qur'an, Allah says, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِي أَقْوَمْ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا What we have revealed in this Qur'an, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ It guides to that which is most upright. Yesterday I mentioned Qur'an does not follow chronological order. It violates chronology, it shifts from one subject to the other. In fact, yesterday people sent me comments about my talk about the ant, and people were laughing about it and having a good time with it. I said, you know, there's a chapter in the Quran, Surah al -Naml. Allah talks about the ants, and Allah talks about how Suleiman spoke to the ants, and how Suleiman looked at the ants while he's conversing with the ants, and he looked up to God and said, what an amazing world. Why is Allah showing me that? Allah says, look how interconnected all these creatures are, that even my prophets are talking to insects and birds and everything. It's all interconnected. Okay, so I want you to understand that. Allah says, if I were to reveal this on this mountain, it will crumble. Why would it crumble? Because what Allah has given us in this Quran, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَ What we have revealed in this Quran is a shifa and rahma. Shifa is what? Elixir. It's your, it's your um, medication. It's what's going to protect you. It's your, when you have an immune problem, the most dangerous part of our body, by the way, is our immune system. If our immune system is compromised, we can have the biggest muscles, we can be the strongest people in the world, we will fall like flies. Because the minute the immune system is down, you're a sitting duck. And all the carcinogenic matter around me will destroy me within a matter of days. So Allah says this Quran, is a protector, is an elixir, shifa. That when you read this, Allah protects you from that illness. Shifa and rahma. Rahma is extremely important, but I want you to, I'm just gonna go very fast because I'm gonna cut my presentation a little bit short so that, and think about it, and keep it pertinent by the way, when you ask questions, 
and I'm really curious to know, especially my younger brothers and sisters, I'm curious to know your mind. I'm curious to know what, what do you want to hear? What triggers you? I think it's very important because I know when I was a teenager, I wish there was somebody who could infuse that God consciousness in me when I was a teenager. You know, I would have been a very different person in my 20s and 30s. I think I would have been a whole different person. I went through a lot of difficulty in my early you know, years of life. I went through a lot of confusion. I was, you know, what we call a closet agnostic. I didn't know. Is it true? Why do I need prophets? Why do I need imams? Who is God? Where is he? How come I can't see him? Typical questions I hear from people. I look at them and say, oh my God, I was there yesterday. The same questions. So we need to converse. We need to be heart to heart, not to lie to each other, but to strike it with truth, such that when you walk away, you say, oh my God, there is nothing that will replace this. Nothing that will replace this thought that is going to give me so much confidence. Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Men who don't bargain for any price. When we look at our imams, look at Imam Hussein alayhi in Karbala, all these 30,000 soldiers, you know, sharpening their blades. He's a small army ready to be annihilated. They tell him, all you have to do is just, you know, give allegiance to Yazid. It's over. You'll be living like a king. Imam says, never. You will butcher me a thousand times, but you will never get it from me. Why? Allah says, Rijalun. He understands the value of this. So what if he gave by us? And then he lives in a palace. You think he's going to be happy? Soon he's going to get sick and die. And then he has to answer Allah forever? What a foolish idea. Right? So if you examine this, the fleeting world. Omar ibn Saad was given governorship of Ray. Imam Hussein said, you won't even eat the wheat from Ray. You are fighting for that governorship. You won't even eat the wheat from them. Right? Ibn Ziyad had built a white palace in Basra. Imam said he won't live in that palace one day. But look at us. We fight, we cheat, we lie, we embezzle. Right? We do things against each other just to grab things from people. We hoard because we have no fear of God. Allah says that level of certainty in the young generation, the older generation, where you are firm and you, you, there's a million dollars sitting on a table and you can swipe it. You say, never. I will never touch that. The moral level is why we're talking about taqwa. Not the physical level. Physical level works even for atheists. The moral level. When atheists ask me, you know, you and I go to the hospital, we get sick, we get cured, we have children. What's the difference? The difference is you believe in God, I don't. They would tell me that. I said, true. I said, but then how do you answer your moral argument? Who drives your morality? I said, if I cheated you right now, I hurt you. I hit you. Would you like it? He said, no. I said, who taught you that? Where did you get that from? If you're a product of an accident, then why is it that you detest that? Why is it a criminal who hurts other people's children, hates for his children to be killed? Classic, right? You see these gangsters, they go kill other people's children, but when their children are caught, they're crying. Allah says, look how it's come home to roost on them. So why don't they like it? Allah says, have you thought about that? The moral argument when I say to the atheist is, then without a God who's all seeing, who gave me this purpose in life, who drives me and gives me an eternal existence with justice, without that, what, what, what purpose is there in life? What do you mean good? What do you mean kind? It's nonsense. Because if I was a pure atheist and I could kill you right now and take all your money and there's no God and I'll never get caught, I'll do it. Because at the end of the day, survival of the fittest. Look how absurd and evil that is. So this conversation of taqwa is maintenance of morality. What is happening today in Gaza? What is happening today in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq? Every place. Examine. The people who are behind pumping bombs are the ones who are atheists, who don't believe in God. Who say, What's, who cares? We want to conquer them. We want to take them over. We want to kill all their families. We want to wipe out all of Gaza so that our people can come in and expand and build their homes on. You're godless. This conversation is about that. And when you and I get violated, by the way, if somebody robs us or hits us or denies us our justice or our breathing space, how do we feel? I'm asking that question to all of you. 
I'm asking you, my young brothers, when somebody comes and hurts you and you're stuck in a room and you can't do anything, how do you feel? You will feel like the world is on you. Allah says, what are you going to do then? When I was a teenager, when actually not teenager, when I was 9, 10 years of age, I used to see when I would come out of school, I'd see all these bullies beating each other up. Some of them are my relatives. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching them. I was on the type, but they'd go beat each other, tear each other's shirts off and smack each other. Blood would come out. And I'm watching and I'm saying, what is going on? Why, why are we doing this? We're only eight, nine years old. I, when I go to school and I, I watch this, the kids are ever ready to kick each other and beat each other up. They don't realize this is shaitan, this is iblis. And if they develop this and they get away with it, tomorrow they become grand bullies, like Donald Trump. Grand bullies, they bully people. They put their hands in the wrong places, they sue people, they rob people, they lie, they cheat, because they got away with it from childhood. They became a monster. We want to avoid that. That's why we're having this discussion. So Allah says, if I reveal this Quran on a mountain, it will shake. Why? Because it is so high in moral argument. It is so beautiful in its guidance. And I will, I will touch a little bit very briefly before I end. And you will get a little taste of taqwa, of how Allah functions. But I'm just going to give you an example. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this mountain would crumble. Khashyatillah. It's a mountain. Mountain is, has no life. It has no consciousness. Say to who? An atom is consciousness? In modern science, of course, we don't understand it. Allah says, Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ardi al-maliki al-quddus al-aziz. Everything recognizes God. This podium, this microphone, this book, this carpet, if you could talk to it, it will tell you who God is. But you can't. There's a barrier between me and that carpet. Just like the other day, I was, yesterday when I was talking about the insect, I couldn't talk to the ant. I was just rooting for the ant, but I couldn't talk to him. But Prophet Suleiman could. He had a conversation with the ant. So Allah says, if I give you access, you can certainly talk to the carpet too. But you don't have access. Allah says, just know that when I create something, I don't create trinkets to do my work. I create everything that recognizes me, even a tree. Now, if you really understood what I just said, you will treat everything in nature differently. You won't damage things. You'll be very careful with how you do things because you will know that everything is doing tasbih of Allah. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, you know, he says, I don't worship God until I see him. They say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, that's shirk. He says, eyes cannot see him, but hearts can see him. And here's the final sentence he said. He said, I see nothing but Allah. I cried when I read that. Every day I would go into sujood and I said, Ya Allah, give me those eyes. I want to have those eyes. I want to see nothing but Allah. I'm getting teary eyed because it is the highest level of energy I can imagine when you have that feeling to say, really, can I live this world where I meet people, say salam, hug my children, my spouse, my parents, but I see nothing but Allah. Oh my God. That's what we need to train our children and our adults. I cannot stress it enough. That's why Allah says that if I were to reveal this Quran on a mountain, it will crumble how it recognizes who I am. But you, Allah says, you are dhaluman jahula. You are ignorant and reckless. So we come to this Ramadan, thank God Allah gave us fasting. So that you have taqwa. What is taqwa? This ultimate, you might ask the question, what is the ultimate taqwa? See nothing but Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now let's get into some practical reasons. Watch. This verse in Surah Al-Hashr, <coughs> as soon as Allah talks about this Qur'an being revealed, in the next few nights I'll talk about the levels of the Qur'an and how it is the most magnificent book ever brought unto mankind. By the way, we are the only religion where our scripture is memorized even by five-year-olds. No religion, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, nobody memorizes their scriptures. You can't. The Qur'an is the most incredible book when it comes to memory. 
الله سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله recite so you don't forget in surah al-qamar Allah reveals four times walaqad yassarna al-qur'an lil-dhikr fa hal min muddakir I cry when I read this surah I said you Allah the owner of the universe you talk to me like this Allah says I want you to touch this I want you to make that decision for you have the destiny in your hands grab it and come to me and watch what I'll give you but you must have trust in me how many of us follow this Quran repeats four times we made the Quran easy to remember who will pay heed we're the only book in the world with five four-year-olds I've seen memorized contextually Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Tabatabai, when I asked him, I mentioned this before, I asked him, how did you learn this Quran? He was only six years old. He says, Ar-Rahman, khalaq al-insan, allamahul, you know, I mean, khalaq al-Quran, I mean, allamahul Quran, but allamahul bayan. He repeats, allamahul bayan, he's looking at me. I was shivering, like this boy, six years old, is talking higher level knowledge than a scholar. How is that possible? How is a six-year-old possible? Allah says, let me ask you about how Isa declared his prophethood when he was born. So when a carpet thinks of God, when objects can recognize God, why can't a child recognize God? But I take it as a lesson that when I'm dealing with children, I don't consider them foolish. Every move they make, in fact, research shows the first seven years of a child are the most crucial years of learning. All the expressions for the rest of their lives come from the first seven years. So let us be eager to instill the positive moral values with love, compassion, giving, forgiving. And let's make their child's understanding within the framework of Allah's rahmah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hu Allah, Hu Allahu la ilaha illahu. Immediately Allah establishes tawheed. He it is where well, there is no God but He. Why? If you bring anyone other than Allah into this equation, you will start drinking alcohol, you will start committing sins, you will start losing your morals, because now God is flipped upside down and the humans dictate how God should be. The Makkans, the 360 gods they had in the, in the Kaaba, why did they have them? They were using their gods to make money. They were controlling their gods. You know, some gods were made out of dates. You could actually eat your God. You manage to make God out of food. Think about it. How, what an insulting idea. Why did humans go there? Because they want to control God. The minute you control God, you control morals. So Allah says, Huwa Allahu ladhi la ilaha illahu alimul ghaybi wa shahadati. If there is one thing that is the most powerful quality of God, it is his knowledge of the unseen. If you and I, as a human race, had vision of tomorrow with clarity, you and I would be the richest people in the world, all in 24 hours. Because if we knew exactly what will happen tomorrow, we would prepare ourselves today to benefit from everything. The power of knowledge, you see? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that that knowledge is with Allah, okay? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, was shahadati. Why shahadati? He's a witness. How powerful is a witness? We have our respected Judge Turfi here tonight. He's a judge. He's present in this audience. Ask him, how important are witnesses? If you bring credible witnesses and you bring an alibi, solid, the chances of you losing is low because witnessing is huge. You know what is the greatest gift Allah has given me in my understanding? Is knowing that Allah is my witness. You know why? Because I, can, I can't get away with anything and nobody can. What a world. Can you imagine if you had judges on this earth? Today the Supreme Court has been sold. It's been put into the pockets of the rich. And they pass judgments left, right, and center. Where we have these three you know, branches that control the government of the United States. And all of them have become corrupt. They've been tainted from, because shaitan has penetrated it. And the entire democracy of our country is breaking apart. It's breaking apart. And the presidents are having fun with it because they are billionaires and they're playing with it. And you and I are going to be victims of their misdeeds. You watch. Their legislations are going to take all our rights away. 
You look at how insurance companies get away with it. Look at how credit card systems work. 26%, 27%, that's worse than a loan shark. That level of usury is absolutely illegal. In the world of real estate, there are usury laws where you cannot charge more than 6% commission. And if you go over that, you're violating the law. But look at the usury laws being violated every single day. People who borrow on credit cards can hardly pay. And those credit card companies are usurping your wealth. Why? Because they work with the leaders, went into Congress, changed the laws, and made us all victims. And the laws will keep changing. You watch. Because the satanic system has no God consciousness. Allah says, I am shahid. I watch everything. And don't worry. لا يحزنك كفرهم. When I read this ayah, it really calms me down. Every time I have a problem in life with people who do injustice, I read this ayah and I, I thank Allah. لا يحزنك كفرهم. إلينا مرجعهم فننبئهم بما عملوا. إن الله عليم بذات الصدور. نمتعهم قليلا ثم نضطرهم إلى عذاب غليظ. Wow. What a sentence. He said, don't let their mischief, kufr, bother you, O Prophet. They're doing a lot of zulm. They're killing, like the Netanyahu's of today. Don't worry. لا يحزنك. Sure, go fight them. But don't let it bother you. Don't think they're strong. Allah says, I let them enjoy for a short time. نُمَتِّعُهُمْ قَلِيلًا I let them have pleasure for a short while. ثُمَّ نَذْتَرُهُمْ Then we grab them. You know, when George Bush died, Ronald Reagan died, Henry Kissinger, the two-legged monster, Winston Churchill, Allah said, ثُمَّ نَذْتَرُهُمْ إِلَى عَذَابٍ غَلِيلٍ I will grab them and I will question them. Like in Surah Al-Jumma, Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Wow, you couldn't strike it more beautifully. That death which you're running away from, it will catch you, it will meet you, and you will return to the knower of the unseen and the witness who will tell you what you did. I think that's phenomenal. Because if I go in front of a human judge, the judge is, knows limited amount of information about me. But God knows the essence of my existence. My tongue will speak. My hands will speak. My heart will speak. There is nothing I can do to lie. Allah says, Iqra kitabaka kafa bi nafsik. Read what has been written on your chest and on your neck. Read it because I have recorded everything. That is such a consolation, brothers and sisters, that while I watch all this ignominy and killing that's taking place in in the world today with all the usurpations and today the modern day colonialism. There was a time when the British and the French and the Italians and the Portuguese and you know, the, the people of the Netherlands, when they took Africa and took Asia and started conquering the world and abusing everybody, that Alhamdulillah most of it has been broken. Thank God people have risen. But there's a new form of colonialism. It's the IMF. So it's the World Bank and they trap you. Shaitan hasn't stopped. So Allah says, how are you going to get peace knowing how this devil works if you don't hold on to me? So this message is to all of us. Confidence. Today the resistance force that's fighting in that region, you know why they're succeeding? Because they have the Quran. They have Allah. They have the Prophet. And who are the best ones? They have Ahl al-Bayt. Nobody is more effective and powerful. Study the geopolitics of the world today. Who is the one who is laser focused, hitting the heart of Iblis? This giant Iblis is shaking. And this, we look at this little creature, we think it's a little creature. This little creature is like Dawood hitting Jalut. And saying, so you want to see? Allah says, I have this name. I have this connection. So Allah says, Alimul Ghayb wa Shahadati wa Rahman al Rahim. He is the merciful, the extra merciful. I'll continue with this, I'm out of time. There's a lot for me to say, but I want to touch on the practical aspects of taqwa. And tomorrow, I will talk about the practical aspects of taqwa through leadership of Allah. I'm going to move to the next stage. Tawheed, I think I've touched sufficiently within these few days. Nubuwa, 
leadership. How important is it? And you will see taqwa is entirely pegged with my belief in risala, in nubuwa, in wilaya. You break that, taqwa breaks. I will talk about it, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabban aghfir lana wa li khonina al-lazina sabakuna bil-iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lil-lazina amanu. Rabban innaka ra'uf ar-Rahim. If you have any questions or comments to make, but please, you know, keep it, keep it appropriate, and I think uh, try your best to, and you know, don't feel shy to ask questions. Sometimes people come and ask me questions. I say, why didn't you ask that in the audience? This is what I was afraid. I said, do you realize how valuable your question is? The fact that you've asked this question is so valuable that others would benefit if it was answered, because that will be something that that person is asking, and maybe they didn't have the courage to ask. It takes a few seconds to kind of say, okay, what is this brother talking about? Yes, sister. Okay, good. She wants to elaborate on free will. I'll repeat the question. the right thing to choose. Okay. Good. Okay, I'll, I'll answer it and then if there's more you can jump in, okay? So the sister is asking a very good question with reference to free will. The key sentence, the key word that you spoke about was Allah knowing the future. I think that's the tricky part. People say God knows the future, then where is my free will? That's the classic question people ask. One question. The other question, that, the other part of your question was that in my choices, what if I make the wrong choices? Okay, so let, let me explain first that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of the future does not imply that he made me do that choice. Allah is out of time, out of matter, out of space. And as I mentioned before, knowledge of the future is a fundamental authority of God that gives him his all-powerful all God. A God who doesn't know the future is a weak God. He's no different than us then. Correct? Think about it. If we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, you're weak. Because you're lost. You know, whatever comes. Allah is beyond that. So his knowledge of the future doesn't mean that he made me do it. The best example we give is meteorologists. You know, let's say at 4 o'clock today, there's going to be heavy snow. You know, and they say it like at midnight. Today at 4 p.m., so you're talking about almost, you know, 16 hours later. And then the snow comes exactly at 4. But nobody says that the meteorologist brought the snow. But the meteorologist said it with a great degree of certainty. Now you might say, but that's, you know, uh, possible. I said, no, assuming it's possible, do you ever possibly apply that to the meteorologist? He said, no, never, never. Then why, why did the meteorologist know that the snow will come at four o'clock because his knowledge of how the physics of the world works, he was able to calculate the reaction. Allah's knowledge is infinitely greater, thus he knows all the reactions that will ever happen by the choices we make. So that's one. Secondly, when you ask about choices, Allah says, Asa an takraw shay'an wa khayrun lakum wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. That which you don't like, may be better for you, and that which you like may be bad for you. So when you make a choice, like Nasib, for example, you marry a person that happens to be the wrong person, you say, oh my God, what a mistake, terrible, you know, I'm suffering. No, you're not. It's by design that you made the choice for the moment in how you understood, and you did it in the best of your abilities. If you, you know, took a dart and you threw, there were three girls, 
and it just threw and it landed on one and you marry it, then I'd say, okay, you're crazy. But typically we don't do that, right? We look at this person and we say, well, I think this person is really good. And you know, when people are looking to get married, they're angels. Sure. Alhamdulillah. Anything, brother. Anything. Just sign the contract. Just say, Qabiltu, please. <laughs> then you're, you're going to start sweating, brother. Because <laughs> I'm a gold digger. So you say, well, then what's the, you know, what's, what's your point? He said, I'm going through hell now. Right? So at the end of the day, oh my God, I'm doomed. Did God decree this for me? Allah says, I decree everything. I give you that power of choice. Within my decree, you work only within my decree. But within my decree, you have the limited free will. Now, I want you to know that God has given us free will. Proof positive. One example we say is Allah is all good. 100%. We all know, even atheists argue, for God to exist, he has to be all good. They argue with that. Interesting. But does evil exist? 100%. Absolutely it exists. Oh my God, it's like hitting us on our faces every day. Well then, since Allah is all good, then where is evil coming from? Ah, it must be from the free will. SubhanAllah, there is no other way. Now you might ask, well, how is, that, you know, how is that working? So let me define, what is evil? Evil, or a sin, is the willful rejection of good. Fire burning a building is not evil. A car hitting another car is not evil. Accidents taking place is not evil. Physical realities are not evil. Evil has to have an intention behind it. When you go to court, you have to prove the willful intent to have committed the crime. If you did not intend to commit the crime, and though there was a death that took place, you may be exonerated and found innocent. But why is that? Well, because the intent was not there. And Allah and the Prophet said, Innama a'malukum bin niyat. Your deeds are dependent on your niyyah, your intention. That's why salah, fasting, when we fast in Ramadan, we keep a niyyah. Without niyyah, our prayer is useless. Wudu, when I'm doing my wudu, I have to have an intent. What is this wudu for? Allah says, if you don't put an intent, your wudu is nullified. Wow. Niyyah, that's what brings good and evil. Take the free will out. Because the way, niyyah is intent. Take the free will out, there's no evil. Re reflect on it carefully, you will see. Evil doesn't exist when there's no free will. It's impossible. Did I make, did I answer that? Good. Please, and look, this is a complicated area. You know, I've had conversations with professors, theological, you know, all kinds of philosophical professors. And they look at me and say, how did you come up with that? You know, when I had uh, Richard, uh, I mean, Michael Corey, who was my, you know, partner in the debate when I did it with Dan Barker and, you know, um, and when I did that debate, I sat with Michael Corey. I said, Michael, you've written many books. You're an author, you're a debater. You've written the book, The God Hypothesis. What's your definition of evil? And he went around in circles and circles and he couldn't come to it. I said, let me tell you my definition. And remember, you know, may Allah rest his soul. Michael Corey has passed away. He was a great person. To me, truly a muwahid. He loved God. I saw it in his eyes. That's why I invited him. But I asked him, and he looked at me. He says, you know, I'm a professor. I've done research for decades. I've never heard such answers. I just smiled. I said, the Quran has given it to me. The Prophet has given it to me. Ahl al-Bayt have given it to me. What I have is access to greater knowledge than all academia put together. I sit with professors in Ivy schools. I have coffee with them. I say, explain to me your function and purpose in life and what is your definition. And when they talk, I, I look at them. I said, yeah, there's truth in it. There's, you know, half truths, whatever. I don't judge them. But all I say is, let me tell you my version of it. Maybe it'll add to your thought pattern and maybe you will add that as your way of life. That's what we need to do. Right? But free will... The limited free will. Now, what is limited free will? A person comes and asks Imam Jafar Sadi, what do you mean by limited free will? It's not complete free will. If we had complete free will, by the way, then we would decide our birth date, we decide to become a fish one day, and become a bird the next day, you know, we decide to become an angel the next day, you know, do whatever we want, right? You know, go back in time, complete free will. Nobody has complete free will but Allah. 
we have limited free will. So then when the Imam was asked, he said to the person, lift, you have two legs, lift one. He lifted one. The Imam said, good, that was your free will. He said, now lift the other leg without putting the first leg down on the floor. He said, I can't. Imam says, that's your limited free will. You can only do so much. Other than that, you don't have that will. Allah says, I'm only going to test you in your ability to what you can do. Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت. Allah says, the good and the evil all come to you in its own design. You will be tested based on your abilities. I, I love it. Honestly, I have so much consolation. Knowing that no matter what these criminals are doing, even those children who've been killed, those mothers who've been decapitated, those African Americans who were taken as slaves for centuries, Allah is gonna give them high stations of paradise. On judgment day, they'll be the first people entering paradise. Because Allah says, you suffered so much, welcome. For the world was evil, I will punish them. But you, I will grant you high stage. Isn't that amazing? When Allah says, you know, لا تقول لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون. Don't say that those who die in the way of God are dead. No, they're alive. What does Allah say? He said, look, that person died for my cause. Their life was taken. Their wealth was taken. Imam Hussain alayhi salam, his infant child received a three-prong arrow. Allah says, don't worry. This little boy, Abdullah, who you call Ali Asghar, is in the highest stations of paradise. Don't worry. Don't worry. I think that consolation is amazing. You might think we're, we're answering this to make ourselves feel good. I promise you, and I'm standing on this, if anybody has a suggestion of anything alternative to this, I'm all ears. Because I've been doing this too long. And there's absolutely nothing, and I say this with confidence, there's nothing other than what I just stated. Everything else is conjectural nonsense. Please hold it. Any questions from our brothers? Yes, brother. Yes. To reject God. Yes. Okay, very good. Excellent question. Did you all hear the question? So his question was that uh, taqwa is very important. Belief in God is very important. He's concerned that when we go through these doubts in religion, and we become what we call closet agnostics. And many of us, by the way, even as Muslims, while we submit to Allah, we do takbir, we do salah, deep down, you know, we wonder if Allah is really there, especially when problems come, especially when a loved one dies. I was reading Hadith Qudsi, and Allah says, if I take your loved one and you hit yourself, you annoy God. Don't do that. Don't hit yourself when I have taken the soul. Do not do that. Listen, it's interesting, Hadith Al-Qudsi mentions that. Interesting, meaning you're complaining to God. Now, when we hit ourselves for Imam Hussein, it's a different thing, we're not complaining to God. There, we want to empathize with the pain of Imam Hussein. It's slightly different. This one is the generic. So the brother is asking, that what about people who are not fully committed to Islam? What happens to them in their salvation? Salvation by Allah, and I'll talk about it in my lectures, but as a brief introduction, Allah guarantees all mankind salvation. Atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews, Hindus, everybody has potential for salvation. And the taklif that a person goes through within their framework of how difficult their lives are, Allah will gauge that on judgment day. So the religion to Allah, the only religion to Allah is Islam. In Nadina in Allah al Islam. And Allah mentions in another verse that any religion other than Islam, Allah will reject it. Not acceptable. Logical makes perfect sense. So this idea of what we call religious pluralism is blown away from the Quran. 
The idea of ratiocentric notions of religion where, you know, my religion is central but everybody gets, no, no. Allah says the deen of Allah is one. Another quick point, by the way, people say among the Abrahamic faiths, Islam is the latest iteration, the latest version of the Abrahamic faiths. Every one of us in this room should immediately stop that person and say, excuse me, that is not correct. Islam started with God in the universe and definitely in action when Adam was created. And Adam was a Muslim, he was a prophet, and Islam started then for humans. Don't tell me it's a new religion that came 1400 years. 1400 years ago, it was completed as a favor. Today, I perfect and give you this gift called Islam. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Very important to understand that. So salvation for all mankind is subject to the individual realities. There are Muslims who pray, who go to Hajj, who fast, who will not enter paradise because Allah deems them as munafiqeen. They did it for show. They were hurting others. Now, how long they will tarry in, in hell? Allah says, لَعْبِثِينَ فِيهَا أَحْقَابًا They will remain in it for some period of time. Others will remain in it for a very long time, if not forever. But that's the prerogative between God and the creation. The, pro the issue that we understand is that the majority of the human race has been created by the grace of God to enter a blissful reality. And because they're born Christians and Jews, they're trapped socially, economically, psychologically, and sometimes it's very difficult because they're constantly being bombarded with wrong information. Because they go to church, they keep hearing the wrong thing, and they consider it right because, you know, it's like that white elephant. You keep repeating the same thing, starts to become truthful. Like it's a fact, they say, that Jesus was crucified. Allah says, وَمَا قَتَلُوا وَمَا صَلَبُوا وَلَكِنْ شُبِّ عَلَهُمْ وَمَا قَتَلُوا يَقِينًا Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified. And he was absolutely for sure not killed. Now, the Quran is completely challenging the Christian ideology of the crucifixion of Christ. But as a Christian, two billion plus, they will swear Jesus died on the cross. It's a lie that has been concocted for 2,000 years, and it's become factual. Many times I speak to Christians, and I talk to them at that level, I say, God is merciful. Why would he kill himself? And of all the things, if you commit a, a, can you imagine if I'm a judge and I love you, you know, and I have a son, and because you, you murdered someone, I said, okay, I love you too much, so you know what, I'm gonna go kill my son. People say, are you insane? There's something wrong with you. I mean, God does that for, for his love? Are you serious? Like, where did you get this? How do they hide it? Salvation, don't worry about it. I mean, I recently in Canada had a four-hour debate with two Christians, very learned Christians, two of them, back to back. One is answering the other, I'm watching them. And I, I would bring a quote from the Bible, I said, what is this? Then the, the other one looked at it, I said, you're working so hard to validate. I said, look at Islam. It is so natural, the Tawheed is so natural. The greatness of God is so natural. You have to keep making these stories. Jesus is complaining on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What do you mean by that? Did he come to die on the cross? But what happens is when people are constantly told wrong ideas, and then there was some kind of a tacit attempt to validate the invalid, we, the lay, take it as truth because we don't know. That scholar who's wearing a nice garb looks more intelligent than me, so whatever he's saying must be right. Now, what will happen on Judgment Day? God only knows. But if your resonance were you to see the truth, you will immediately jump like those magicians with the Pharaoh. They were the, they were the hand of Pharaoh. They were the magicians who made Pharaoh strong. And when Musa Salam threw that stick, and they noticed that their rope, which was tricking people's eyes, that the, that the snake of Musa was real. These are magicians who are experts in how to elude people, in illusions. They were masters of illusion. They saw that, they said, this is not magic, this is real. And what happened? Right away they said, we become Muslims. So Allah said, look, look, they were kuffar. They were mushrikeen. They considered the Pharaoh their God. Look what they did. Pharaoh said, you are accepting God without my permission? He said, we don't need your permission. He said, then I'll crucify you. I'll cut your limbs off and I'll cut your tongues off. They said, do it. Wow. All their lives they were disbelievers. In one second, 
We don't know what lies in the hearts of people. So salvation is open for all. But you and I as Muslims will be questioned the most on Judgment Day. For Allah will say, I conferred this religion on you. See? Struggle. The Prophet is a witness over you and you are a witness over the people. What are we doing today? Are we witnesses of other people? So when those Christians and Jews and non-believers and agnostics, you know, what was I in need? I needed somebody to come and talk to me. Shaheed Mutahari spoke to me. Shaheed Bakr Sadr spoke to me. You see, these great scholars, you know, um, Sayyid Mustafa Lari spoke to me. When I read them, I said, oh my God, you've opened a universe for me. They said, come, let us teach you the real truth. I grounded myself, I completely deconstructed religion and reconstructed it. And when I did, I realized, oh my God, what I have is more precious than all the wealth in the universe. This is the religion God has given me. That's why people say, how come you're so, I said, when I see a glittering diamond that's so valuable, it's material junk, relatively speaking. But when you see something valuable, could you ever turn away? I, the other day the brother was asking, how do you keep your focus? I said, have you ever fallen in love truly? He smiled, didn't want an answer. But when you're truly in love with somebody, even if they turn old, they become sick, you don't care. You just want to be with that person. That love relationship cannot disconnect you because what you see is so powerful, it's so priceless, nobody can fool you. That's the love we're talking about, taqwa. Inshallah. Are we out of time? I mean, just say it, brother. You're the, you're the MC. Yeah, so we'll continue inside the masjid, those of you who have any further questions. And please don't be bashful in asking. These questions are really beautiful. I love these important philosophical questions. Please have a strong grasp on them. And then you will see when you talk about religion, God, the way God works, the way things happen with justice, injustice, they all start making sense, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There you go ahead, make your announcement, please. Thank you. Just one moment, brothers and sisters. There are QR codes in front of you if anyone wants to sponsor any of our nights, make any donations. Like we said, we will continue our Q&A inside the masjid, inshallah. We will start at 11.15. For those of you watching online, it will be streamed on Instagram at Youth of Wisdom. Again, it will be streamed at Youth of Wisdom. Uh, let us conclude with a dua al-hujjah. Bismillahi rahmani rahim Allahumma kun li waliyaka al-hujjati ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا so we will see you in, inshallah inside the masjid for the continuation of the